So Nikesh, Nikesh I'm, uh, I'm delighted that you're back at Brainstorm, except for one reason. I, uh, I reviewed the video of our interview from five years ago this morning, and I look a lot older, you don't look a lot older. You've got to de-stress your life. <laughs> I, I guess I do. Yes. Um, let's jump right in. You have sort of, uh, you're, you're, you were just named president of SoftBank. You've been there less than a year. Mm -hmm. And so you have, you have dual roles. You're, other than Masayoshi Son, you're the head of investing. Yes. And you're also running, helping run a very large company. Um, let's start with the investing. Where are you focused right now? That's hard. Um, we've still been thinking about it for the last um, nine months because Masa made this brilliant investment amongst many uh, in a Chinese company, which most of you know, called Alibaba. He invested $200 million for about 32% of the company so that, uh, that I think it, today's market cap is about $65, $70 billion. I think over the next 10 to 15 years, we're going to have to figure out a way of being able to deploy that equivalent amount of capital in companies so that we can continue his legacy of making good investments. So I think it's fair to say we're going to deploy a few billion dollars a year of capital. But given that there are so many smart VCs out there, so many smart people in the audience who go invest in companies, I don't think we can compete with them. So instead of competing where people invest between five to $50 million, where there's probably about a million companies in that potential list, we're going to go the next step up and try and look at people who we believe are either acquiring escape velocity or, or are on a trajectory to acquire escape velocity, supplement them with both resources, both in terms of capital and people that we're in the process of hiring, or they can come borrow some of our people to work with them so that we can help them go sort of to the next stage uh, of development as a company. Let's talk about a few you've already made because, and just so everybody uh, is clear on what Nikesh just said, he said we're going to go up a level, which means not investments in the $50 million and, yes. and below range, investments yes. in the 100 and 200 and 300 and more $100 million range, Yes, correct? we made our first billion dollar investment in Korea. Talk about that one. A um, billion dollars of equity. Yes. It's a big investment. <laughs> I think it got some people's attention. Yeah, <laughs> Tell everyone about it. Well, it's actually, uh, it seems that the current uh, requirement is you have to drop out of Harvard. <laughs> this, uh, this young entrepreneur, Korean guy, um, dropped out of Harvard, decided that the e-commerce market in Korea has been stable for a very long time. It's one of the first, very first e-commerce markets in the world. They have 80% mobile broadband penetration. Everybody walks around with a mobile phone that actually works, and you can have data access wherever you go. Um, and he realized that a lot of the players who've been around for 10 or 15 years have been deploying a model from 10 or 15 years ago, and there was room for disruption. So he went in with a mobile-only app. It's kind of a mix between an Amazon slash Alibaba model, where he's carrying inventory as well as you know, providing service and delivery. In addition, he's also running a marketplace. And the company's called? It's called Coupang, C-O-U-P-A-N-G. Uh -huh. um, I suspect that's the, that's the domain name you could find. How did you find each other? How did he find you or you him? Well, I think the good news is that uh, some people know that Masa is originally Korean. Uh, or he's Korean, but he's born in Japan. Ethnic Korean, right? Yeah. Ethnic Korean. So he's born in Japan, and uh, I suspect he's a hero to many entrepreneurs in Korea. So before entrepreneurs in Korea go ahead and seek their next big round, they try and get in touch with him. In addition to that, what I've found in the last 9 to 12 months is that uh, the VC industry is very collaborative. So as I spend time with people in the VC space, they come to us, they tell us some of their investments. Obviously, they'd like us to get involved, not only because we will write a big check, but also they believe, they believe you can help in the execution. So, And you write a big check at a higher valuation than they were invested in. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> Talk about um, a company called Grab Taxi, which is in Southeast Asia. Yeah, so you know, one of the things we've done is, uh, purely coincidentally, it's not that it's by intent, it's more by, more by as it happened. We concentrated the early investments in Asia. Um, I happened to be there for a month and a half after I left Google. Masa had been looking at companies over there. And we spent a lot of time looking at which one of the internet models have been deployed successfully in Asia so far, which ones haven't been. So if you look at the internet industry, if you look at the Googles, the Twitters, the Amazons, the Ebays, all, a lot of the successful internet businesses, usually when you look at the execution in Asia, that's where once in a while a local company comes up and the company from Silicon Valley is not able to execute. And this is not a knock against them, it's local conditions, it's local requirements, 
language issues, payment issues, a whole bunch of local issues come up, cultural issues where it becomes very hard for somebody sitting in Silicon Valley to actually write code and execute in Asia. So he said, why don't we come from there and see if he can invest in some of those companies where there are local entrepreneurs who are actually trying to tackle the problem. Like look at, look at Baidu, look at Naver, look at a whole bunch of the messaging applications all over Asia. Uh, China is a special example. But if you look across Asia, Korea, China, India have all shown uh, examples where global internet giants have not been able to execute as effectively as local, local internet players. So we went the other way and said, okay, who, are, who in this market is trying to deploy a global model, which you know in the long term that the model they execute well will be successful. The model has been proven. And we found some companies. We found GrabTaxi, we found Ola, we found Snapdeal. So clearly, you know, the entrepreneurs are very, very smart. Um, clearly, they're trying to deploy the playbook, which has been deployed globally. But they're looking at things from a very local perspective. For example, in India, it's very hard. To, it's like less than 12% credit card penetration. How do you deploy a sharing economy in a 12% credit card model. You end up in a cash or delivery model. You end up in a model where actually drivers deposit money and then they get leads to customers. So it works the other way around. So we looked at some of those entrepreneurs and that's how we ended up with uh, another dropout, uh, mm -hmm. Anthony Tan, who actually went to school with Bomb Kim from Coupang. Hmm. Um, fair to say you're not only making a bet on some of these companies, but you're making a bet against the Silicon Valley leaders that, that want that market. Uber wants that market, right? Yeah, I want a lot of things in life too. Um, <laughs> I've, I've had to fight for them, and I'm sure they'll put up a good fight, and Travis is a very competent individual, and he's done a phenomenal job in executing, not just in the U.S., in various parts of Europe, and I suspect these local entrepreneurs will give him a run for his money. The good news is, as he said to me, he said, in case you'll never understand, you're not an entrepreneur, but from our perspective, we have a portfolio of companies, so in our portfolio, we hope some of them will work tremendously well. Some of them will have a tough fight. Some of them may not work. I don't understand the context of Travis's comment. What was it that you weren't understanding in your conversation? Well, he wasn't very excited that we were investing in companies that I, compete with this company. I see. As you would expect. I would, I would expect that he And would. he's a passionate individual. And yes. He's perfectly legitimate in his right to think so. Yes. Um, on that sort of line of questioning, with a very few exceptions, you're based in Silicon Valley. You have a checkbook. You could be making investments in Silicon Valley at, at that same high level, and you aren't. Why, why aren't you? We made a few investments. We made an investment in Banjo. It was the first time I've seen somebody actually try and do something with social, local, and mobile data for the first time together. You know, I've, I've always had this view that the last wave creates the opportunity for the next wave. So Google came about. People had lots of you know, information on the internet, you could go search for things. We all started searching, we all, we all were on the internet. Facebook came about, we could find everyone else on the internet. And over time, people went from anonymous names to real names, and slowly and steadily, they went into mobile. Facebook did a fantastic pivot to mobile. And now, for the first time, you see a company which is looking at mobile, social, and local data together at the same time. So we made an investment in Silicon Valley, uh, in that company. Uh, we've looked at a lot of different things in the valley, and I think, uh, I'm, I'm sure this is not new news in this forum since I've been listening to some people up here, and the valuations are rich. But you, you, the valuations are rich, but that doesn't mean they're bad investments, right? I think people teased uh, Microsoft when they invested in Facebook at what I think it was a, a fifteen billion dollar valuation. Said that was ridiculous, and that worked out well. Yeah, I suspect uh, if you had to count those valuations that worked out well, you'd run out of companies before you ran out of right. fingers in your hand. Right, right, right. Um, I think I saw Goldman Sachs, I haven't read the report, but an email came about saying the next 100 unicorns, which I think in common parlance is a company with a valuation of a billion dollars. Uh, if there's 100 billion dollar companies out there which are being created in the last 12 to 24 months, I'm pretty sure there will be some sort of a distribution in those. Some of them will not make it. Some of them will stay at a billion dollars. Some of them will do really better than a billion dollars, and some will do exceptionally well. Um, and if I was really, really smart, I'll try and find the ones which do exceptionally well, just like the other 100 people in this room or 5,000 people out there looking for those same companies. You've had a unique opportunity for nine months now to watch one of, I mean, nobody would dispute that Masayoshi Son is one of the great investors and the great operators of our time in the, in the technology I think he's world. Brilliant, yeah. And other, you know, in other areas. What's, what's his secret? Um, he's one of the nicest people I've known in my life. Um, he's always hustling, he's always thinking, he's always thinking two or three steps ahead. Uh, he does not understand the concept of a box, as in thinking in a box. Uh, he's constantly thinking out of the box. 
He's constantly thinking two steps ahead. He's constantly trying to find a way to innovate uh, out of the current situation. And, uh, and he's just a pleasure to work with. Uh, but you know, he's always thinking two steps ahead. He's always thinking, what happens if this happens, if that happens, if that happens? And sometimes you sit there and say, oh my god, he's already five, 10 years out. And that's actually an interesting way to look at it. If you look out five or 10 years and say, isn't it blindingly obvious that things should be like this? And you work backwards and say, yeah, it means things today have to change. Can you uh, articulate what you, and by you I mean you and he and your management team, think the long-term opportunity for Sprint is? In case, in case everybody doesn't know, SoftBank owns Sprint, the what, number four mobile player in the United States? Well, we have the fearless leader of Sprint sitting right here in the front row, so I think that's an apt question for him, but <laughs> if I could channel his words, uh, he would tell you that uh, his task is to make sure that he has a lot of happy customers and a fantastic product in the U.S. market, and I think he and his team are striving hard towards making that happen. Uh, staying on SoftBank, I'm intrigued. So not only are you going all over the world with your investments and your, and your operational activities, but SoftBank's a very big Japanese company. Yes. And I feel like in our dialogue in the U.S., we don't talk about Japan anymore. We talk about China. We talk about India. Maybe we talk happy about Korea. About and you're happy about We're very happy about people not talking about Japan. At least, at least the 5,000 people don't come looking in Japan for investments or else we have more competition. But what, what is the state of the Japanese economy from your perspective? Um, I think the Japanese economy is just fine. I think uh, it, you know, in Japan, you don't see big moves in any direction. It's kind of like a steady economy. It's kind of like the culture. Uh, it kind of goes in a steady pace. Um, you know, there are some very, very innovative companies, as we know, which produce phenomenal things around the world. And uh, you know, SoftBank Japan, which is our telecom business in Japan, I think going back to the earlier conversation on Sprint, it's actually one of the biggest telecom turnarounds in the world and Masa engineered that when he bought SoftBank Telecom for $20 billion by borrowing close to 17 or $18 billion. He's turned that around and it's now one of the best networks in the world and probably has one of the highest EBITDA margins in the world. So you know, we have to give him credit for the phen phenomenal turnaround that he did and hopefully we can bring some of those lessons back to the United States. He's been spending a lot of time in the United States, right? Yes. And, and, what, and what is the upshot of that? What is, 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 that's not only because of Sprint, I assume. Well. You know, if you think about what's happened in the last few years is that from being a purely Japanese company and him spending all his time turning around the Japanese business, he has since made tremendous amounts of investments around the world, uh, whether it's uh, in Alibaba or whether it's in the investments he made recently in India. So clearly SoftBank is turning into more and more of a global company. I think more than 50% of our value comes from assets outside of Japan now, maybe even 60, 70%. And in that context, He's trying to spend more time understanding what's happening around the world, not just in Japan, because we think that the next 10 years, the investing opportunities are going to come from outside of Japan as opposed to in Japan. Uh, I don't want to uh, waste the opportunity to, to ask you at least one Google question. You spent how many years at Google? 10. And it was, a, it was 10 interesting years. You got to watch it Fantastic. go from very small to, to very large. Where, in your estimation, is Google in its development as a, as a company, you know, sort of think of it as having gone from a, a baby to a child to a teenager when you were there. Where are they now and what are their, what are their challenges? Oh, that's a good question for Google, but I think now they're the big gorillas in it, aren't they? They are, but right. they're still young and they're having growing pains. Are they? I think. Where do you think they're having growing pains? <laughs> this isn't about what I think, it's about what you think. <laughs> well, I'm just trying to understand from your perspective. Okay, you're, they, you're, Facebook has made a quicker pivot to mobile than, than Google has. Well, it's fair to why, say Google why? probably has Android, which yep. was a bigger pivot than Facebook did. I think mm -hmm. Facebook probably, I don't know, but I, I read once that Facebook was also looking at OSs, but they decided that Google had Android and that was doing just fine. And I read recently that Microsoft wrote down Nokia, so they must have made some decisions on the mobile front. So I think Google seems to be doing okay on mobile, right? Okay, so you're bullish on Google is what you're saying. I'm just trying to find out, you, may, you preface the question by saying <laughs> they're having growing pains. Just trying to understand where you see the growing pains so I can help you <laughs> corroborate whether they are having growing pains or not. You made a well, presumption, so I'm just trying to validate your Yes, yes, I understand. I'll, I'll, I'll try one more. Go for it. They, uh, G Google is sort you of- You see, I'm trying not to answer Google questions. Yes, of, course, okay, I, of, course, of course I understand. Uh, Google gets criticized for a lack of focus because they're doing many, many, many things. And the answer always has been, well, they make so much money on, on, on AdSense and AdWords that that's not a very interesting conversation. Will that, can they continue that? 
You know what's fascinating is, I was thinking about this last night, that you know, I was anticipating a question for which you haven't asked, so I'll, I'll tell you what I was thinking anyway. Please. Um, in the internet space, you know, there's lots and lots of companies, lots and lots of billion dollar companies, lots of people are looking at success, but there's a few carcasses on the way as well. There's a bunch of internet companies which actually have never been re-engineered or never been able to come back to their glory days. And um, who, 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 for example, you have in mind? I, I was reading old Fortune articles, <laughs> and if you go back and read them, like you watch the video, there's a bunch of names in there. Uh -huh. You guys have like really seriously dinged a few companies, uh -huh. so it's in that list. But uh, AOL is an example. Yahoo's an example. See, perhaps you must have written about them. Right? <laughs> so my point is, but those companies still generate tremendous amounts of cash flow because yep. there is there is a there is a lot of inertia in the industry and in the business where cash flow continues to happen. So I don't think the advertising business is in despair in any way, shape, or form. I mean, if you look at the 100 unicorns or so that are out there, which are all trying to you know, generate the next Facebook, the next Google, or whatever, there's only three ways they're going to make money. They're going to make money through advertising, they're going to make money through some sort of subscription where people will pay, or they'll make money through some sort of transaction. Right? So if they're not making money through transactions, they're not making money through a subscription model, they're more than likely going to try and monetize by advertising. I think it's fair to say, Ten years ago, there was no large advertising sales force in the digital space. I think ten years hence, both Facebook and Google have built one of the most stupendous advertising sales forces in the world. So, and you cannot underestimate the fact that there are eight, ten thousand people out there selling advertising every day and generating billions and billions of dollars of advertising revenue. So, I think a lot of these unicorns will have to go back to the Facebooks and Googles and do some sort of a deal to get them to sell advertising on their behalf because it's extremely inefficient for a small company which has a hundred million dollars in ad revenue or even a billion dollars in ad revenue to go aspire to a fifty billion dollar ad revenue by generating and creating a ten thousand people ad sales source because it's extremely inefficient. So you've, you've professed your continued love for the, uh, for the advertising model in the internet. Would SoftBank be interested? Is there a price at which SoftBank would be interested in buying Twitter? Um, if the value is right. Well, that, that, my question is, if so, so the answer is yes. Is there a price at, at a which? price? I don't know what the price is. I've never uh -huh. sat down and thought about it. But I'm sure at a price, something's worth buying as long as you believe it has a positive growth trajectory in the future. Do you think Twitter has good growth potential? I haven't spent much time thinking about it. Really? Um, questions? Right in front. Please bring the microphone. Hi. Good. It's coming. It's coming. And when you get it, just please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Nishit Desai. I'm a strategy-oriented lawyer. Um, we look at the future uh, technologies and identify today what new legal problems will come up. What I'm trying to figure out, where do you see the new from globalization to say celestialization, what are the new opportunities, the big opportunities? Now, a lot of things have happened on the internet and other kind of stuff. Slowly gets that in getting a little boring as well, in some ways. Uh, but what I'm trying to see, what are the new things that you see with huge opportunities in the privatization of space, bitcoin mining, uh, bitcoins, uh, how would that impact? Uh, what do you see next five years hence? Uh, uh, just a guesswork. I don't hold you to that. Uh, no liability. There's no way you can hold. Oh, see, it's wonderful when a lawyer asks a question. He prefaces. He, he ends the question saying, "No liability. You will not be held liable for the answer." <laughs> I like that. Please make sure you're gonna you're gonna save this video, right? Yes, absolutely. Part especially where he says absolutely. no liability. Yes. Okay, good. So now is my now is my turn to put my foot in my mouth. Saying, right? <laughs> um, I think what's fascinating is if you look at the models that have come up in the last two or three years, where we're using technology to disrupt almost every existing business process out there. Um, to the extent that, uh, you know, what is Uber? Uber, we all had that service before, but now Uber makes it very convenient for us to be able to find a ride when we need it. So suddenly that market's grown. Look at Airbnb. So a lot of these new models that are coming up in place are effectively disrupting a lot of the existing businesses out there. Um, as we go forward in this journey, I think there is going to be tremendous amounts, of, or actually there already is, a tremendous amount of data that is being collected about me somewhere. It's just there in many, many, many different places. Uber has some, they know where I travel. Airbnb has some if I decide to go stay in someone's house. My Android phone has a lot of data about me. My Google search has a lot of data about me. And my, there's a whole bunch of data which is not out there yet. My doctors haven't decided to share the data digitally. But at some point in time, I think 
a lot of that data about you and me is going to be collected, which is where all your legal skills are going to be required uh, because it's going to have it's going to be sort of the double-edged sword. Is on one hand, it's fantastic if I didn't have to go take a blood test every time I showed up in a doctor's office, and every time I traveled to India, I didn't have to bring a big pile of papers to show my doctor what's going on in my life. So it'd be fantastic for me to be able to travel with my data and for data to make my life a lot more convenient. On the on the flip side, somebody knowing a lot about me gives me the heebie-jeebies. Maybe I'm of that generation. Maybe the next generation doesn't care. So a lot of I think a lot of stuff around the around the data space is going to happen. I think a lot of stuff which we haven't seen is when everything, so right now, no, it's kind of like we've got a hub and spoke model. Every device speaks to something centrally. At some point in time, all these things will start speaking to each other. And when they start speaking to each other, a whole bunch of new things will begin to happen. I think that next, in the next five to 10 years, a lot of the stuff around us will start speaking to each other. Nikesh, I want to end on the, the subject of with that we haven't discussed yet, your, your native country, India. Yes. Uh, you, you are investing there. You, you've lived most of your career, you've done most of your career outside of India. Take the minute we have left and, and, and tell us your, your forecast for what the economy and, and life will look like in, for the rest of our lifetimes in India. You know, it's a, it's a billion plus people. Uh, they do not understand the concept of population control, which is uh, good. The number of customers just keep rising, so it's good for businesses. Um, it's a very young population as a consequence. There are over 350 million people under the age of 25. Uh, they're all very tech savvy. You know, there is no broadband fixed line. It's all mobile. There's a lot of mobile activity going on. So I think from a technology perspective, you'll see a lot of the models that we're seeing in the West will get deployed in India on the mobile device. It may not be as fast as we we're expecting it to be, or it may not be as fast as we see it over here. But I think, what is that famous phrase that, you know, you always overestimate the short term and underestimate the long term. So I'm a very long term bull for them on the market, and hence you've seen us going big in India. So we've learned that you're a long term bull not only on India, but also Google that you haven't looked much at Twitter, and that your relationship with Travis Kellen, it could be better than it has been. <laughs> Nikesh, it's thank you. Fine. Thank you, Adam. Okay. Thank you for having me. <laughs>